Section 54 of A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley-Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress, by John Buchan. Chapter 52, The Battle of Verdun, First Stage. February 21 to April 10, 1916. Part 3. On the afternoon of Saturday, 26th February, the German assault had failed on the two wings at the Côte de Poivre and at Douaumont. The great advance which began on the Monday before was stayed, but as yet the enemy did not know it. All he perceived was a check to the movement on his flanks, and he attempted to counterbalance this with a blow by his centre, where the farm of Haudremont marked the westernmost spur of the subsidiary Douaumont Plateau. At the same time, with his left, he attacked the most easterly spur, where the wood of Haudremont looked over the Verve. The tactics were not unlike those of Wagram, if we take the central attack as corresponding to Macdonald's advance with the Fifth Corps on Sussembrown, and the attack on the spur of Haudemont as paralleled by Davoust's attack on Markgraf Nassidl. The struggle raged far into the night, but everywhere the French lines held. Meantime, on the extreme French right, the drawing in of the Verve posts was successfully completed. That night the snow fell heavily, and all Sunday the 27th and Monday the 28th the combat continued. On the west, the attack on the Poivre Ridge came to a standstill, largely because of the French guns on the left bank of the Meuse, which dominated every movement on the western slopes. The French held the south side of the ridge and the Germans the end towards Louvemont, but neither side could advance, since the German guns around Beaumont and the French guns on the Charny Height between them compelled a stalemate. The isolated hill of Talou had long been untenable by either side. A violent artillery attack was made on the Douaumont position, and the two divisions of the Brandenburg Corps attacked successfully, but without avail. An attack on the wood of Haudemont likewise failed, and the battle lines lengthened southwards, where the German left strove to turn the French right in the Verve. On the Sunday, the enemy, advancing along the Metz railway, came in contact with the French holding the station of X, about a mile and a half from the village of that name. South of the station is a hillock marked on the map 255 metres, about 70 feet above the level of the plain. The French held this height against all attacks during the Sunday and Monday. On the latter day, the Germans pushed against the village of Manul, six miles south of X, where the road from Metz joined that which followed the skirts of the hills and against Fren, a mile to the southeast. About half of Manul village fell into their hands but with this success, they had to content themselves. Their aim was clear. If they could advance onto the heights by way of the fren verdun road, they would have won a position in the rear of the main defence. Now at the close of February fell one of those lulls which are a notable feature of modern battles. The German assault on the Verdun salient had followed a different method from their many salient battles on the Eastern Front. There, they had endeavoured to strike in from the flanks and cut at the roots. At Verdun, they drove straight on the apex, as they had done during the early stages of the First Battle of Ypres. The reason is not far to seek. The Verdun salient was shallow, no more than a bulge in the front, and it provided no tempting re-entrant angles, save at saint Mihiel, where the precariousness of the German communications made a great forward movement difficult but it made up for this disadvantage by being split in two by a broad and swollen river. All that part on the eastern bank of the Meuse formed, so to speak, a salient within a salient. If the French could be driven back in confusion, there would be a desperate muddle on the few roads and a desperate congestion at the neck of the bottle, the bridges of Verdun. It therefore seemed wise to them to hammer in this segment by frontal attacks as being the shorter and simpler road to their goal, the possession of Verdun and the cutting off of large numbers of French troops and guns. That frontal attack all but succeeded. But by the end of February it had clearly failed, so far as any hope of instant success went. The carefully planned stages of the battle had somehow miscarried. 
they had been too slow to have the proper cumulative effect. Between each, the French had rallied, and each new step had to be taken against a prepared and wholly undemoralized opponent. Why, with their weight of men and guns, and in the view of the slender numbers of the defense, the Germans did not succeed better is something of a mystery. Partly, it may have been that in the winter weather and difficult upland country there was undue delay in the succession of the stages, in moving forward artillery, in bringing up shell supplies, and in refitting troops. Partly, it may have been as the French maintained that the infantry attacks, in spite of their complete disregard for human life, were not delivered with the fire and resolution which bears down all opposition. The German troops had been told that the guns would do the work for them, but when the guns stopped short of destroying a position, they were puzzled and dispirited. They died heroically, but they did not exact the full price of their sacrifice. Again, it is clear that the untouched French gun positions on the left bank of the river unduly narrowed the German front in attack, and prevented the wings from giving the proper support to the centre. A frontal attack is well enough, but it must have its flanks safe. Accordingly, at the end of February, the German High Command revised its plan. Slowness to revise had never been a fault of German strategy, even when it meant an arduous readjustment of details. The heavy howitzers had been fixed in their emplacement in the woods of Spancor and Hangri, and could scarcely be moved, but many mobile batteries were taken across the river to the woods of Sepsage, just east of Montfauçon. The main German route of supply for the whole front was the railway from Metz to Conflans and Spancourt, whence a new line had been constructed westwards to Dun in the Meuse Valley on the verdun sedan line. A branch had been recently made from Dun to Montfauçon. So far as communications went, and without them the great guns could not be munitioned, the Germans were well equipped for fighting on both banks of the river. The new plan, which Ludendorff had always advocated, was to strike at the French positions on the west side of the salient, drive them in, and menace Verdun from the northwest. Such a stroke would get rid of the handicap to the central advance from the French artillery on the left bank of the Meuse, and would, moreover, if pushed even a short mile, threaten the main rail and road communication of Verdun itself. At the same time, as the battle developed, the right side of the salient at Vaux should be attacked. The German plan was now a return to a favourite battle order of Napoleon's. Blows on each flank, followed at the proper moment by a thrust at the centre. For it is clear that, as the consequence of this flanking operation, the German staff still looked to a victory on the Poivre du Armand front in the unlikely case of the French troops on the heights not having voluntarily retired as the clouds darkened. It may be asked why the Germans did not contemplate a turning movement from the Verve against the French right. As we have seen, they attacked at various points on the edge of the heights, but from a casual survey of the map it might appear that a movement, say along the verdun fren road, would have given them better and speedier results than an advance up the western bank of the Meuse. The latter would drive in a wedge on Verdun's flank, but the former would take the whole position in rear. The reason must be found in the configuration of the Verve itself. It has a stiff clay soil which, in an open winter, makes it a mass of swamps and brimming ponds, so that, as in Poland, the only routes for heavy transport were the causewayed roads and railways. Besides the Donviers and Metz railways, there were from Vaux southwards to Fren four roads which ran up to the edge of the hills. The vaux Dieppe road, the main verdun longuillon highway through Etain, a little road from Châtillon to Moranville, and the great Paris-Metz road which passed through Manoul. Along each of these highways the Germans attacked with their columns, but the soft soil on both sides did not permit of easy deployment. Worse still, the whole plain was under observation from the heights, and all the roads and crossroads were commanded at long range by the southeastern forts of the Verdun Ancient. Hence, the German attack being delivered in winter conditions was perforce confined to the northern, northwestern, and northeastern sections where their communications were ample and well screened and they had underfoot the dry soil of the hills. The new plan involved an adjustment of the command. The Imperial Crown Prince remained in charge of the operations, 
but the attacking force was divided into two groups, that on the right bank of the Meuse being under Mudra, and that on the left under Galvitz, who had been summoned from the 11th Army in Macedonia. Footnote. In April, Mudra was succeeded by Lokau, and in July, when the Battle of the Somme began, Von Francois took the place of Galvitz. End of footnote. Meantime, Pétain had not been idle. His second army had been taken out of Tonglé's group and was under the direct control of Joffre, who came frequently to Verdun and gave minute personal attention to every detail. The robust cheerfulness of the commander-in-chief was an admirable complement to the meticulous industry and resourcefulness of the army commander. Pétain divided the area into sections and his forces into groups. He perfected the arrangements for motor transport, he quadrupled the field guns and doubled the heavy pieces. He constructed four successive positions of defence. Above all, he diffused throughout the army a spirit of reasoned confidence and sober resolution. On Thursday, 2nd March, it was noted by the French command that the German guns had become active against their front between the Argonne and the Meuse at Forges. The French lines there, unchanged for many months, ran from the river up the narrow marshy valley of the Forge Brook, covering Forge Village. The Germans had the wood of Forge just north of the debouchement of the stream, but farther west the French had the ridge on the north bank, covered Betancourt, and turned northwestwards in a salient to within two miles of Montfaucon, the isolated hill which had once been the Crown Prince's headquarters. They covered Malancourt and Haucourt, turned south through the wood of Malancourt, passed between the wood of Chepi and the forest of Hesse, covering Avocourt, and then, by way of Valcois, reached the air at Bourreuil and joined the Argonne front toward the Field Morte at Haute-Chevauchy. It is important to note the configuration of the ground just inside the French lines. The Brook of Forge splits at Betancourt into two branches, one coming from Malancourt in the west, and the other running due north in a well-marked valley from the village of Ain and the wood of Bourou. This latter branch needs some attention. On its right bank, between it and the Meuse, is a long ridge of hills which is known as the Goose's Crest. At its western end, this ridge has various summits, of which the chief is the Mortom, 295 metres high, and to the north, just above Betancourt, the lesser height marked 265. From these points, the ridge runs eastwards with a mass of woodland, the wood of Cumier, called in its northern part the Crow's Wood, clothing its southern flank, and just peeping over the crest. It sinks steeply to the Meuse at Rigneville opposite saint and on the south of it, at the bend of the river, lies the considerable village of Cumier. On the other side of the southern branch of the Forge Brook is a slightly higher ridge, rising at one part to 304 metres, separating it from the woods between Avocourt and Malancourt. In any attack upon the French position west of the Meuse, this ridge, called the Goose's Crest, must play a deciding part. If it fell, then there could be no halting for the French short of the ridge of Charny, nearly four miles distant, on which the outer line of de Rivière's forts protected Verdun. Such a retreat would not necessarily lead to the fall of the city, for that the Sharni Heights must be forced, but it would have one immediately beneficial result for the German attack. It would strip from the west bank of the river all those artillery defences which had prevented any outflanking of the centre by way of the Côte de Poivre. It would then be possible to swing south from the Louvemont Plateau and take the Douaumont position on its left flank. But to obtain this result, it was necessary to carry the goose's crest in its entirety, and especially the hill of Mortom, which was its highest point. For this operation, there were only two possible ways, since the flank above the Meuse was too steep for any large movement of troops and guns. There might be a frontal attack from the line of the Forge Brook, between Forge and Malancourt, or there might be a flanking movement on its west from the Avacor Woods against the summit 304, which, as we have seen, confronted the Mortom across the southern branch of the Forge stream. Either, if pushed to a finish, would give the Germans Mortom, and without Mortom no success could be final. It was the key of the western bank as the Douaumont crest was the key of the eastern heights.
The bombardment, which began on 2nd March from the batteries in the woods of Forge at Sepsage, was directed at the French firing trenches along the Forges Glen, at Forges itself, at Malancourt, at the reserve lines on the Goose's Crest and Mortom, and especially at the Crow's Wood and the Wood of Cumier, which concealed the French guns. Moreover, all the hinterland was watered, and the Clermont-Verdun railway, for long in danger, became impracticable. The French transport was now almost wholly by road and motor, and an endless chain of convoys passed and repassed between Verdun and the railhead by that sacred way, which became the most famous of the roads of the campaign. It was a task which involved terrific strain for the men. Each outing, wrote a French transport driver, represents for us from 15 to 25 hours at the wheel, when it is not 30, and for our lorries, 150 to 200 kilometres. This, night and day. On arriving here, we did the journey twice almost without stopping, that is to say, 48 hours without sleep and almost without food. It was so hard that it was decided that there should be only one chauffeur per lorry and that we should take it in turns. Can you imagine what it means to drive one of these lorries weighing five tons and carrying an equal weight of shells, either during a descent of 12 or 14 in the hundred, and with a lorry just in front and one just behind, or driving during a frosty night, or without lights for short intervals when nearing the front? Can you see the driver alone in his lorry, whose eyes are shutting when a shock wakes him up suddenly, who is obliged to sing, to sit very upright, to swear at himself, so as not to sleep, or throw his lorry into a ravine, or get it stuck in the mud, or knock the one in front to pieces, and then the hundreds and hundreds of cars coming in the contrary direction whose lights blind him. For four days the bombardment continued. It was a clue to the enemy's purpose, but in order to prevent the reinforcement by the French of the Malancourt Forge line, a vigorous attack was made on the Douaumont position. The main advance was against the village itself, and from the wood of Hardemont towards the hamlet of Vaux. The Germans got into Douaumont village, now only a heap of ruins, but the French held the higher slopes to the south, for the village was well short of the crest of the plateau. During the remainder of the week there was a series of small actions between Hardemont and Hardemont. These were, from the German point of view, containing battles, while the main stroke was preparing elsewhere. The bombardment was now general on the whole front, from Fresnes to the Argonne. German aircraft attempted to bomb the villages west of Verdun, where the French reserves were accumulating, and the city itself was heavily attacked by the long-range howitzers and naval guns. Pétain had correctly divined the enemy's plan and had made all preparations to meet the threat on the west bank. At dawn on Monday 6th March, the guns fell silent and two German divisions descended upon the Forge Glen. The French first position was clearly untenable in an attack. Its right flank was in the air, for across the Meuse from Forge, the Germans held all the bank for three miles up to the debatable land of the Côte de Talou, and so could assail the French wing with converging fire. Accordingly, the French fell back, fighting obstinately, to their prepared position behind the Goose's Crest. Forge fell by midday, and the Germans, pushing along the railway, took Runyaville by the evening and had advanced some way up the slopes of the ridge. Before the darkness had quite fallen, they had won the eastern crest and had penetrated the Crow's Wood, all that portion of it which overflows on the north side of the ridge. On Tuesday morning, the French still held Betancourt, but had been forced back from the Forge Glen across the Goose's Crest at the Crow's Wood, and held the southern slopes of that ridge through the wood of Cumier to a point on the Meuse between Cumier and Rigneville. It was a repetition of what had happened on 21st February between Brabant and Herbebois. The covering troops were withdrawn with little loss from the first lines to the position where they proposed to make their stand. Next day, Tuesday the 7th, came the first attack against the new French line. It was supported by two subsidiary movements on the east, an attack on Fren, which took the place and several hundred prisoners, and a successful assault on the redoubt in Hardemont Wood, which gave the enemy a position against Vaux. 
but the main fighting was at the Goose's Crest. There the French counterattacked and won back most of the Crow's wood, but had to face a fierce German pressure east and west of Betancourt. Next day, the 8th, the struggle for the Crow's wood continued, and the French recovered all of it except the eastern end, while they continued to hold their ground at Betancourt. That night, the German effort swung to the other flank, according to their fashion, and centred on Vaux. Looking up from the Verve Flats, the traveller could note a small glen, like one of the folds in our own South Downs, with steep sides crowned with clumps of wood. A railway and road ran up the hollow, and halfway there was a straggling village of one street with a church at the eastern end. To the north rose the wood of Hardemont, and peeping over its summit, a little to the left, he caught a glimpse of the round top of the Duamont Fort. On the south side, the height was capped with the old fort of Vaux, around which stretched the Chenois wood. On that Wednesday night, the Germans held the Hardemont crest, and so could safeguard any advance up the glen from flanking fire. Just after midnight, when the moon had set, the 3rd Brandenburg Corps, now replenished from the depots, and an infantry brigade from Posen, attacked up the ravine, and for a moment carried the ruins of Vaux village. The French counterattacked and promptly drove them out with the bayonet. When daylight came, the Germans returned to the charge, advancing not only against the village, but to the south up the steep slopes of the Chenois wood against the old fort on the escarpment. The attack was delivered with great resolution, but by the evening it was checked and no ground was gained. That day saw the end of the Brandenburgers as a unit so far as the battle was concerned. They were withdrawn from the line in a state of utter disintegration. On Friday the 10th, the enemy, now largely reinforced, came on again, but was caught by the French guns before he could get to close quarters. Saturday the 11th saw the final effort. In the early morning, the Germans swept up the ravine and took the eastern end of the village and the ruins of the church. On their left, they pressed up the hill, losing heavily on the slopes, but their impetus slackened before they reached the crest, and they were stayed at the wire entanglements round the fort. Next day, there was no infantry fighting, but only an intermittent bombardment. The attack on Vaux, had it succeeded, would have turned the Duarmont position as successfully as if the Côte de Poivre had been carried. Simultaneously, all along the Verve side there were attempts to advance, notably in the woods southeast of Danlou at Aix and at Manuel. All were unsuccessful, and like clockwork, the effort seesawed to the other wing. The German strategy was that of a woodcutter who strikes first on one side of the trunk and then on the other. But the method is useless unless each stroke of the axe cuts out a substantial wedge, and this the German blows had failed to achieve. It was as if a forester, after cutting off the loose bark, had come to an inner core so hard that it turned the edge of his tool. From Thursday the 9th to Tuesday the 14th, the struggle went on between Betancourt and the Goose's Crest. On the 10th, a fresh division was launched against the Crow's Wood and the Germans advanced their front to the edge of the Wood of Cumier. Next day, the French first line, running from Betancourt southeast up the slope of the ridge on the Cumier Road, was carried, but the French regained part of it by the evening. On Sunday the 12th, there was a great bombardment of all the ground from Betancourt to the river, especially the French lines in the wood of Cumier below the Goose's Crest. Next day, it was discovered that the bombardment was extended at long range to the Charny Ridge and the wood of Bourreau, as if to cut off French reinforcements preparatory to a general attack. That night, the artillery never ceased, and on the morning of Tuesday the 14th came the expected thrust for the Morton. The French line at the moment formed a salient, of which Betancourt was the apex. From Betancourt, it ran in front of the country road leading over the shoulder of the Goose's Crest to Cumier. This road, a mile and a quarter southeast of Betancourt, crossed the spur of the Morton marked 265 metres. The French lay on the northern slopes of this, and then bent back over the Goose's Crest, behind the Crow's Wood, and so to the Meurs. The Germans based their attack on the Crow's Wood, which they now held, 
and directed it southwest towards the point 265 behind the French trenches. A Silesian division advanced in the center, while a brigade moved on the right up the slopes of 265 from the Forge Brook, and another brigade on the left advanced directly against Hill 295, the highest point of the Morton Massif. The striking force was scarcely less than 25,000 men. The centre, coming on in five successive waves, pushed back the French behind the Betancourt Cumier Road. Its flank was caught by the French guns and checked, but the Silesians managed before nightfall to win two positions just under the crest of Hill 265, which made that hillock no longer tenable. The mile of ground between it and the Crow's Wood was now in their hands. Berlin announced the capture of the Mortom, but the news was false. The French still held the key positions, and all that had been lost was an outlying spur. There was a lull on Wednesday the 15th, but that night a new artillery preparation began, and at three o'clock in the afternoon of Thursday the 16th, a second attack was made on the same method as the first. It was caught by field and machine guns in flank and completely broken up. A counterattack by the French right drove part of it in disorder with heavy losses back to the shelter of the Crow's Wood. That same night, there was a new assault on Vaux. Twice, the ruins of the village were attacked, but the enemy was held back just west of the church. Three other attacks, based on the cemetery, attempted to scale the slopes to the fort. They were caught by the French searchlights from the heights and broken up by the French guns. The woodman's stroke on both sides of the trunk had struck an adamantine core. So closed the second phase of the battle, on the 22nd day since the guns had opened between Brabant and Herbebois. The result of the blow on the west bank of the Meuse had been to win a triangle, less than a mile deep, between the Brook of Forge and the Betancourt-Cumier Road. It had sharpened the Betancourt salient, but it had not yet secured the key point of the Mortom. On the east bank, most of the wood of Hardemore had gone, and the Germans were up to Vaux village, but they were no nearer carrying the Douarmont plateau. Till now, the attack had suffered in scarcely less proportion than the defence. But the Germans could not cut their losses and break off a barren struggle. They had claimed victory too brazenly, and must go on for very shame's sake till they won some apparent decision. They were faced with a new syllogism. Verdun depended on Douarmont and Charny. These, in turn, depended upon the Mortom. The Mortom refused to yield to a frontal attack. Therefore, an effort must be made to take it in flank. Only one flank was possible. Accordingly, on Friday the 17th, the German guns opened in a fresh bombardment between Avocourt and Betancourt. The new assault on the key point was coming from the west. End of chapter 52, part 3「Section 55 of A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley-Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress, by John Buchan. Chapter 52, The Battle of Verdun, First Stage, February 21, to April 10, 1916. Part 4. With the opening of the new phase, the great struggle changed its character. The original plan had gone to pieces. The Battle of Verdun, as conceived by Falkenhayn before 21st February, was lost by the end of the first week. The swift surprise which would have given the Germans the city, and thereby a resounding advertisement for German arms, and which in certain circumstances might have broken the French front, had died away into a war of trenches. Verdun might still be won, but its winning would have less military meaning. It was not a key point, but merely an insignificant heap of ruins, since the French front was held not by fortresses, but by entrenched field armies. Its capture would be a certain gain, but only if the price exacted were reasonable. Had the Crown Prince entered it on 26th February, he would have paid much for his victory, but it might reasonably have been considered to be worth the cost. By the middle of March, it was very clear that Verdun, even if it fell next day, 
would have been bought too high. The essence of war is to win something from the enemy at a fair price. In every battle, both sides have losses. If the loss to one side, whether in position or in men, is proportionately greater than the loss to the other, then the latter has won. If a man at a sale bids fifty pounds for a picture and secures it, he may have a bargain. If he pays a hundred pounds, it may still be worth while. But if the price is run up to a thousand, and he persists, he may have blundered into folly. The analogy is not exact, for a buyer at an auction is not compelled to pay unless he gets the coveted object, whereas in the case of Verdun, the enemy paid cash down at every bid, and had no security of any gain. The Allied counterattack, for which the rest of the German front was waiting, did not come. The great armies of the north and centre remained fast in their trenches, and save for an inconsiderable attack at the Navarin farm in Champagne, there was no auxiliary movement during these days to divert Allied reserves or confuse the Allied strategy. It is clear that on this point the calculations of the German high command were completely upset. What they had counted on did not come to pass, and they sat still in the expectation of it, while with every hour their chances of victory declined. The struggle on the Meuse Heights could only have been justified at this stage if the attack were taking toll of the defence out of all proportion to its own losses. But though the French casualties were the higher, the disproportion was not enough. The pick of the German regiments were flung desperately forward, hideously mauled, their gaping ranks replenished from local reserves, and sent in again. In some cases, as much as 60% of the effectiveness perished. Footnote. The 3rd Brandenburg Corps is a case in point. It started on 21st February with over 20,000 bayonets. By 28th February, it had lost two-thirds of its officers and non-commissioned officers, and more than half of its effectives. Between 29th February and 8th March, it was taken out for rest and refitment. On the latter day, it went again into action, still, in spite of drafts, some 40% below strength, and two days later was withdrawn from the battle a mere shadow of its former self. It had lost, in ten days' fighting, 22,000 men, or rather more than its total original strength. End of footnote. That was inevitable from the nature of the fighting. What was more important, the original tactical plan was relinquished. The artillery bombardment, which should have made the infantry advance easy, grew less complete as the days passed. There was less precision in registering, greater delay in bringing up supplies of heavy shell, and the halts between each stage enabled the defence to prepare for the next blow. The fresh troops used for the attack became patently inferior in quality since the best men had been used up with tragic speed, and there was not now the promise of swift victory to give heart to the assault. Again, the general advance on a broad front, which had been the second stage as originally planned, was growing impossible. Armies tire like individuals, and a great sweep, once it had been checked, cannot be easily repeated. Accordingly, we find a series of local attacks at widely separated sections which could not correctly be said to have any cumulative effect. Had the salient been narrow, the blows at its neck might have been formidable, but the Verdun position was not properly a salient at all. The base was too broad for the cutting-off tactics which had served Germany well in the Eastern Campaign. The battle was now to all intents a frontal attack upon the French lines. It had resolved itself on the German side into an effort to create little salients and then push them in. If we return to the simile of the woodcutter, we may say that the attempt to cut great wedges on each side of the tree had failed and had been replaced by a number of small and casual gashes. Such a method may serve to bring down a sapling, but in this case the trunk was broad and hard and its roots deep. Strategically, the French held the command. In Joffre's order of the day to the Verdun defenders, issued during the first weeks of March, the situation was accurately described. For three weeks, you have been undergoing the most formidable assaults which the enemy has yet attempted against us. Germany counted on the success of this effort, which she believed to be irresistible, and to which she devoted her best troops and much powerful artillery. She hoped that the capture of Verdun would revive the courage of her allies and convince neutral states of German superiority. She had reckoned without you. 
Night and day, in spite of a bombardment without precedent, you have resisted all attacks and maintained our positions. The struggle is not yet at an end, for the Germans need a victory. You will succeed in wresting it from them. The Germans needed a victory. This was the only explanation of a strategy which refused to count its losses and persisted in a game which under no conceivable circumstances could now be worth the candle. Such needs, in essence not military but political, are in war the fruitful parents of disaster. Tactically, too, Pétain was master of the situation. He followed the traditional French practice of holding his first line lightly, of surrendering it under attack, and of winning it back, if necessary, with the counterstroke. When a desperate push was made, he was prepared to fall back a little, provided he could take sufficient toll of the enemy. In certain cases, such as the Douaumont Crest or the Mortom, where the position was vital for his plan, he was prepared to push the counter-attack with resolution and lose men on a heavy scale. But his general purpose was to incur no needless losses and to make the enemy pay soundly for every yard of ground surrendered. His attitude was that of the trader who has wares to sell to anyone who will give his figure. He regarded no village or crest, not even Verdun itself, as immune from this grim bargaining. The Germans may have any ground they want, so ran his argument, provided they pay a high enough price. It was the destruction of the enemy's forces, not the sacrosanctity of a strip of land, which would gain for France the victory. The new bombardment on the west bank of the Meuse, which began on 17th March, reached its height by midday of the 20th. That afternoon, the first infantry attack was made on the avocourt malancourt line. The Mortom, as we have seen, was the key of the left bank. Its one accessible flank was the western, and of that, the key was Hill 304. That hill, again, could only be approached from the west and northwest where it sent down long gentle slopes to the upper feeders of the Forge Brook. On the west, the wood of Avacor covered the slopes of an underfeature which ran up to Hill 304. To the north, in the hollow, lay the conjoined hamlets of Malancourt and Aucourt at the foot of another easy spur. If the Germans could take the wood of Avacor, they would have won a position well up the slopes of 304 and would have excellent cover for the final rush for the summit. If, at the same time, they could press beyond Malancourt and Aucourt and win the northern slopes, the hill, which was the key of Mortom, must presently be in their hands. On that Monday afternoon, the 20th of March, a Bavarian division, supported by a discharge of liquid fire, fought its way into the eastern part of the Avocor wood. By night, fresh troops were brought up, and towards evening, in spite of the brilliant work of the French batteries at Aisne, the German line was pushed to the edge of the trees where the hill pastures began. All Tuesday, the Germans were busy putting a barrage behind Hill 304 and hammering at the point of the Malancourt salient. On Wednesday, they built a redoubt in the captured Avocor wood as a base for the next advance on the hill, and their infantry attacked on a line between the corner of the wood and Malancourt village. They gained a footing on the little hill southwest of Aucourt, but failed to win the French redoubt there. On Thursday and Friday, the bombardment continued, and a few more trenches were won at Aucourt. The Malancourt salient was now being pinched very thin, and the vital point, the west slope of 304, was gravely threatened by the enemy. Then came a short lull. From Saturday the 25th to Monday the 27th, there was nothing but intermittent artillery fire, which by the Monday evening had grown to that intensity which heralds a fresh attack. On Tuesday, that attack came at Malancourt, where battalion after battalion was hurled on the weak French troops in the village. In this fight, the French heavy guns played a great part, and the waves of the assault, descending the slopes to the forged glen, were terribly shattered by their fire. The real danger point was not there, but at the Avacor wood, and on the Wednesday afternoon, Pétain resolved on one of those rare counterstrokes which he used only to win back some vital position. It was completely successful. The Germans were driven in for more than 300 yards, and the redoubt they had made fell into French hands. Counterattacks followed, but they failed to retrieve the loss. Meanwhile, at Malancourt, the Germans managed to fight their way into the northwest corner of the village. Next day, there was a pause, 
broken only by futile counterattacks from the Avocor wood. But during the night, having brought up reinforcements, the Germans again flung themselves on Malancor. The French garrison repelled the first attack at 9pm with heavy loss to the enemy, and again at 11. But about 1am in the morning of Friday, the last day of March, the invaders won the southwest corner of the hamlet. The loss of Malancor was now only a matter of hours. The strength of a full division had been used against its kilometre of front, and the price had been paid which the French required. Fighting desperately among the ruins, the garrison fell back to Ocor, and the capture of Malancor was announced in Berlin. Pétain went farther. On that Friday night, he quietly drew his troops at Ocor across the little stream to a strong position on the lower slopes of Hill 304. The Germans were ignorant of this move, and for several days continued to bombard empty trenches. The salient had been blunted, the French lines adjusted, and the enemy could make nothing of his gains. He could not debouche from his new position because of the French command of Hill 304 and Mortom. In that bare little glen there was no friendly crow's wood to give him cover. On the night that the French were filing silently across the forge stream, a new attack was launched on Vaux. There had been two abortive assaults on the Thursday night, and from midday on Friday a heavy bombardment had been loosed along the front from Poivre to Hardemont. Late on Friday night the enemy returned to the charge, and the second of two attacks gave him the western houses of Vaux village up to the point where the roads forked around a little pond. The one on the right climbed steeply between the Hardemont and Calier woods and reached the plateau near the old fort of Douarmont. On the morning of Saturday 1st April, the enemy struggled to advance up this road, which was carried in a shallow ravine among the trees, but the French guns from the south held him. Next day, Sunday, on that narrow front of little over a mile, he launched the equivalent of a division in four columns. He penetrated most of the Calier wood, pressing up the ravine, and also from the wood of Hardemont. This was a substantial success, for he had made of the French lines behind Douarmont village a difficult salient, and he had also made a salient of the old Vaux fort and the bluff it stood on. As at Avocor, the French counterattacked with purpose, for the ground must be won back to safeguard this position. General Nivelle had arrived with the Third Corps, in which General Mongin commanded the 5th Division. That night their guns were active, and at dawn on Monday the 3rd, Mongin pressed the invader out of the Calier wood, all except the slender horn of it close to the Douarmont Redoubt, recovered the ravine and the ground round Vaux Pond, and with a last fine effort won back the western skirts of the village. That day's fight was one of the severest struggles in the whole battle. The narrow glen of Vaux, up which the German columns moved, was soon a charnel house, choked with the dead and dying. Through these human barriers the German heavy guns blasted a road for the reinforcements that came on time and again to breast the hill. In the advance which gave them the Calier wood, and, for a moment, the rim of the plateau, the Germans lost desperately. But in the subsequent counterattack, the French, after their fashion, spent their strength freely to redeem a real tactical loss. On the balance, the enemy had paid the heavier price, and he had no gain to counterbalance it. Meanwhile, the battle had been resumed on the western flanks. On Monday the 3rd, an attack on the line Ocor betancourt took the Germans into the trenches north of the Forge Brook, which the French had evacuated on the last night of March. For the next two days there was a lull, but on Thursday, 6th April, in the afternoon, the Germans finally entered Ocor village and attacked Betancourt, which was now the apex of a perilous salient. That night, part of the French first line trenches were carried between Betancourt and Hill 265 along the Cumier Road, and all the next day was filled with a new and intense bombardment. Under its cover during the night, the enemy flung his horns south and east of Ocor and gained a footing in two small woods situated between the village and the spur of Hill 304. That day, there was also fighting at Betancourt, which, it was very clear, must soon be relinquished. When darkness fell, the garrison was withdrawn, and on Saturday morning the enemy was in possession. The French front now ran from the redoubt in Avocor Wood, along the slopes of Hill 304, to the forge stream northeast of Ocor, and thence to a point a little south of the Betancourt-Ain and the Betancourt-Cumier crossroads. 
It continued just south of Hill 265 and behind the Goose's Crest to the Meuse, north of Cumier. Since 17th March, when the flanking attack on Morton began, on the average less than one mile of ground had been relinquished on a front of six. The adjustment of the French lines was complete just in time, for on Sunday the 9th an attack was delivered on the Morton position, which, except for that February Friday at Douarmont, was perhaps the fiercest engagement so far witnessed in the battle. On the Friday, Pétain had been aware of a great concentration behind the heights which run from Forge to Malancourt. It was not less than five divisions strong, and two of these divisions had not yet appeared in action. Hitherto, the Germans had attacked Mortom first from the north and east, and then by way of Hill 304 from the west. But now they aimed at a general assault on the whole front west of the river, the first of the kind since the main effort for Douarmont failed on 26 February. Two divisions were to push through the Avocourt and Malancourt woods against Hill 304, and they were to be followed by two divisions moving from the Crow's Wood directly on the Mortom. These two main assaults were to be supported by efforts on the extreme flanks, against Cumier on the east and Avocor on the west. At the same time, across the river, there was to be an attack on the Côte de Poivre, and a constant bombardment of the east bank was designed to mislead the French as to the true point of danger. At eight o'clock on the Sunday morning, the attack from the wood of Avocor began, an attack in dense formation after the familiar German pattern. It never got out of the trees. It never even reached the French trenches. It was driven back by the French field guns and the big pieces around Aisne. But it was well covered, and its retirement was free from serious losses. At 10 a.m. came the attack from the Crow's Wood, the old theatre of the first bid for Morton. This effort failed disastrously, and the troops were mown down in swathes. Presently came the first flank assault, along the flat riverside meadows between Runyeville and Cumier, between the Goose's Crest and the Meuse. It penetrated into the ruins of Cumier, but was broken up and destroyed before it found a lodgment. All the afternoon these attacks were repeated, and at one point on a front of about 400 yards, the first French trenches were carried at the Mortarm. There, the contest was fierce till the darkness, and great glory was won by the 151st Regiment of the Line, by the 16th Battalion of Chasseurs, and by the 8th, that famous battalion which, on September 22, 1843, had held Sidi Brahim as the Spartans held Thermopylae. Late in the evening, while the world was lit by a fantastic sunset, came the assault on the extreme western flank at Avalcourt by a Bavarian brigade. This had some of the elements of a surprise, but the ground it won was regained by a counterstroke before the darkness fell. Next day the battle still raged all along the front, and at the Côte de Poivre the Germans won a ravine on the southeastern edge. But by Tuesday the 11th it was clear that they had failed. They had used some nine divisions. Indeed, they had used them up. At every point the great assault was held and checked, and the constant supplies of new troops only added to the carnage. The general assault was no more fortunate than the local assaults. Flank attack had failed like frontal attack, and no one of the key points of Verdun was in the enemy's power. The 9th of April marked the end of the third phase, the lateral movement on Mortarm. The repulse by Pétain of the combined effort from Avocourt to Poivre marked the end also of the main German plan. Each item of that proud enterprise had crumbled. The scheme which was to give Verdun into their hands in four days had failed to give it in 48. Henceforth, system went out of the German tactics, wild rushes were diversified by spells of inert weariness, and in both action and inaction they were bleeding to death. End of chapter 52, part 4《セクション56of the History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress by John Buchan. Chapter 52 The Battle of Verdun, First Stage. 
February 21 to April 10, 1916. Part 5 Few battles nowadays have a clean and satisfactory close. Some never end, or end only with the campaign. Fighting did not cease at Ypres and Luz, Champagne and Arras, but there comes a moment when the chances of the attacker's main purpose have gone, when the initiative in any real sense has departed from him, and when he is compelled to look for some means of breaking off the engagement without a naked confession of failure, or of continuing it on different lines. The advent of such a moment may be guessed from various signs. The lack of a serious strategic purpose in attack, fighting, so to speak, only to pass the time, the supersession of generals, lengthy official explanations that the purpose of the movement is something quite different from what was stated at the start, a claim of victory with bogus figures added in proof, the sudden resumption of activity elsewhere. If we look for these signs, we shall find some of them apparent about the middle of April. The attack of April 9-10 to 10 was not the end of the battle, but it was the culmination of the German effort. The Germans will, without doubt, attack again, said Pétain in his order of the day. They did attack during the following weeks, at the Cayette Wood near Douaumont, at the ravine between Poivre and Haudremont, at Mortom, at Hill 304. Violent attacks, sometimes mustering a strength of two divisions. The tide of battle rolled as far south as Les Epages, where, on the 19th April, three futile efforts were made to pierce the French position. But these assaults were no more than a local offensive. They were not colligated and directed by any conceivable strategic plan. The battle for Verdun had gone against them. Presently came other proofs. Marshal von Hessler, the Crown Prince's mentor, returned to Berlin a discredited man, and more than one corps commander followed. The German press was filled with long exposés of the true objects of the Verdun struggle, which, it was claimed, had succeeded. Sour grapes were cried. Verdun itself was of no importance, and whether or not the city fell was immaterial to the high command. What they had done was to weaken the French field armies and use up their reserves. Following on this, totals of unwounded prisoners were published, and the German staff gave rein to their fancy. Figures were given for certain days and areas in which the number of French prisoners claimed greatly exceeded the total French casualties, and fell little short of the troops actually engaged. Finally, by the middle of April, the French themselves began to take the offensive, at Vaux, at Aucour, at the Mortarme. It was no general counter-attack. That was not the French strategy, but only the winning of a position here and a position there to ease the front. A wrestler, when his opponent's fierce effort has begun to slacken, will shift his grip a little to lighten the strain and get a better stand. So ebbed the first stage of the Battle of Verdun, so far the longest continuous battle in history. It had stretched from the snows of February into the spring sunlight of April. When the first shots were fired, the copses of the Meuse Heights were brown and leafless, but by its close, young green was breaking in waves over the scarred soil, the almond trees were blossoming, and the waterside meadows were gay with marigolds. No less spectacular battle was ever fought. On that arc of thirty miles the better part of a million men stood to arms, but to the observer from any point, from the ridge of Charny, or the southern forts, or the shattered Verdun streets, they seemed to have been swallowed up in the earth. Only the dull, unceasing rattle of the guns, the fleecy puffs of shrapnel on the ridges, and at times mushrooms of dark smoke told of the struggle. These, and the endless stream of transport choking every road, where the might of France moved up to the lines of her defence. The result had been a signal French victory. If Verdun represented a less critical moment than the Marne, it was a far more deadly struggle, and it bit deeper into the enemy's strength. Of all that she had set out to win, Germany had gained nothing. She had not broken the French front. She had not set foot in Verdun city, and thereby won the right to proclaim the fall of a famous fortress to expectant citizens and dubious neutrals. She had not lured the Allies into a premature offensive. She had not even taken undue toll of the French ranks. She had hoped to deliver such a blow as would shake the nerve of France and compel a separate peace. 
but the spirit of France never burned brighter and stronger than when her armies lay on those shattered heights, weary but unconquered. Germany had compelled the expenditure of large stores of shell, and thereby delayed the Allied offensive, and she had won a few square miles of barren highlands. It was the sum of her achievement. As against it, she had proclaimed certain victory on the housetops and suffered the discredit of those who anticipate success and fail. And she had lost troops that she could not replace. Many a famous corps left for Dunn a shadow which could never again in the campaign regain its old substance. If we ask the secret of Germany's failure, we shall find it largely in the neglect of that military doctrine which enjoins the economy of force. Her tactical plan was sound, but the soundest plan may miscarry, and when the immediate success was denied her, she continued to spend herself for a victory which was every day of diminishing value. Verdun to her was worth a price, but it was not worth any price, and it was beyond doubt not worth the price she offered after 26th February. Her political commitments prevented her from cutting her losses and following the true principles of war. She was wrong in her premise, for even if she had succeeded in her aim, she would not have dealt a fatal blow to the armies of France. But she would have won a solid and marketable success. Failing that success, she could not go back to where she began. The absence of victory meant for her a grave and indubitable defeat. Tactically, it may be said that she overrated the power of artillery in action. Her successes in the east against an ill-equipped foe had distorted her vision. She inclined to regard her infantry as if it were a mere escort for the guns. But it is infantry which wins the decision. Its role is the principal one. It is still the queen of battles. An artillery preparation can never be more than the means to the occupation by the infantry of the enemy's trenches. It is clear that time and again her men had not the stamina or the elan to complete the work which the guns had begun. Small blame to the German infantryman. He was tried too high. His nerve was weakened by impossible demands. His units, through their misuse and grave depletion, lost all corporate vigour. Germany treated her human material as if it were a lifeless mechanism, and outraged human nature reacted and foiled her plan. The achievement of France was brilliant to a superlative degree, whether we regard her generalship or the fighting quality of her men. The first of the great French soldiers, Foch, had emerged into the clear light of fame at Marne. Verdun brought into prominence a second. Henri-Philippe Pétain had begun the war as a colonel of infantry, had won his spurs in the Artois fighting in the summer of 1915, and had commanded with great distinction an army in the Champagne battles of September. His mind was firm, elastic, crystal clear, infinitely resourceful. His brain was masterful in detail, without ever losing its grasp of principle and a broad perspective. His knowledge of human nature was profound, and few soldiers have been greater adepts at the training of raw troops and the reorganization of dispirited units. He had a character of singular elevation and strength, simple, modest, patient, gentle, and brave. His devoutness, as deep as that of Foch and Castelnau, had in it something of the rigor of northern France, something of the iron fatalism of his great compatriot, Calvin. He had nothing of Joffre's fatherly benignity and gargantuan cheerfulness, or Foch's southern vivacity and sudden lightning flashes of imagination. But in a crisis, his grave, wise face was to everyone who saw it a refuge and an inspiration. No threat could weaken his nerve, and no fog of war cloud the calm lucidity of his mind. For dealing with a certain kind of crisis, he had no equal. With perfect clearness, he grasped the situation on that hectic 26th February, and with perfect coolness, he made his schemes to meet it. He declined to be hurried into irrelevant counterstrokes, even when a tempting chance offered. He refused to be misled by the enemy's feints. Calmly he made his plan, and resolutely he abode by it. His aim was to hold Verdun at the minimum cost, and to spend men only when he could make the enemy spend in a fantastic ratio. But for all his generous parsimony, he never let a strategic position slip from his grasp. He would give up an irrelevant mile, but strike hard to win back an essential yard. 
During the battle, he drew on many divisions from a wide section of front, but he wasted none of them. When one had done its part, it withdrew, and fresh troops took its place. He was equally adroit in his handling of artillery. The 75s far forward in the line of battle again and again broke up the enemy's advance, and the heavy guns, cunningly placed among the folds of the hills and served by excellent observation posts, defended from afar the key positions. What shall be said of the soldiers themselves, who, for these two months, rolled back the invader? Not the Ypres salient or the nightmare labyrinth was more dreadful than those shattered Meurs uplands. Churned into grey mud by the punctual shells, till they seemed like some lunar desert where life was forbidden. It was a struggle on the defensive, a contest of stark endurance waged with the knowledge that ground must some time be ceded, but with the resolve that the session should be dearly bought. Such a task puts the sternest strain on human nature. It requires not the exhilaration of hot blood and high spirits, but cold patience and disciplined sacrifice. The glib commentators who before the war praised French elan and denied French fortitude were utterly put to shame. It was the fortitude and the stoicism of the French that were their most shining endowments. They showed it under Castelnau at Nancy and under Mauduit at Arras, but Verdun was the apotheosis of the quality. Passeron Pas sang the soldiers and held the gate, a living wall stronger than concrete or steel. Through days of giddiness and torture, when the solid earth seemed crumbling beneath them, they maintained their ground. Advanced posts, as at Malancourt and Ocourt, drew on the enemy and stood at bay, with odds of six to one, till the precise moment arrived for which retreat was designed. Nor did the long doggedness of defence impair the spirit of the offensive. When a counter-attack was needed, it came as if from fresh troops who had never in their lives done anything but move forward. Conspicuous among the merits of the French infantry were the discipline and initiative of the smallest units, even of individuals. Men had constantly to act without orders, at any rate in the first days of the battle, and they showed that austere conscience as to what was personally required of them which belongs to an army which is no mechanism but a living weapon. Left to himself to decide, the soldier in nine cases out of ten chose the more arduous duty. In some words to his chasseurs before his death at the wood of Carré, Colonel Drian spoke of the task which was before each man. In a struggle like that which awaits us, far stretched and parcelled out, no one can entrench himself behind the absence of orders and remain inert. Often there will be occasions when fractions of units will be left to their own devices. To stand fast, to stay the enemy by every means, must be each man's dominant thought. Again, this active intelligence and sense of responsibility were maintained, not for hours or days, but for weeks and months. This was the immense achievement of the French. They did not weary in well-doing. They could preserve on the defensive that fine tenacity of spirit which wears down the enemy as the harder metal wears down the softer. The phrase of the poet on the eve of his death on the battlefield, On n'a jamais fini de faire son devoir, was the keynote of the whole struggle. Soberly and methodically, the French faced a sacrifice to which there could be no limits, a duty which knew no ending. Footnote. These words were found scribbled on the wooden casing of a bomb-proof shelter in the French firing line. Mon corps à la terre, mon âme à Dieu, mon cœur à la France. They are almost translated by Sir Walter Scott's lines. The body to its place, the soul to heaven's grace, and the rest in God's own time. End of footnote. They did this cheerfully and without complaint, because their minds were utterly made up. There was no alternative but victory. The race was ready to perish on the battlefield sooner than accept a German domination. There was something so matter-of-fact in this resolution, which appeared in every word and deed of the nation, that the casual observer forgot how great it was. Its completeness gave them peace and confidence. The renunciation was so absolute, the offering so unreserved, that no one doubted of the issue. Many would die, but of a surety France, in whose eternity they were but a moment, would survive. 
Such faith seemed to be less a human thing than some slow and secret process of nature which, like spring or morning, insensibly renews the world. End of chapter 52, part 5 End of chapter 52 End of A History of the Great War, Volume 2, The Beleaguered Fortress, by John Buchan.